Alhamdulillah, all praise and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us and gracing us with this opportunity that we can continue with another one of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the compilation of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala of his party hadith. And today brings us to the 11th hadith from this series that we're continuing. And this hadith was narrated on the authority of Abu Muhammad al Hassan bin Ali radiallahu anhu, who was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam grandson. And he was one of the dearest person and the most dearest to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He narrated, he said, I have memorized, I have committed to memory from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam these few words. And the wordings are Dharma Yaribuka Ilama La Yaribuka that leave that about which you are in doubt for that which you are in no doubt. Leave those things or leave that about which you are in doubt for that about which you are in no doubt. So this hadith was compiled, was narrated by Hassan radiallahu anhu and was recorded by Imam Tirmizi rahimahullah in his book of hadith and it was in a compilation of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala and this hadith, the wordings is something which is not new to us a few series ago I have mentioned this word in one of the hadith in which this hadith emphasized to show us certain criteria which is part of the life of a Muslim. This hadith goes in line with that of the hadith which if I am not mistaken it was exact hadith number six of this series in which Rasulullah said Al halal ubayyin wal haram ubayyin that halal is evident and clear and haram is evident and clear. And between them are some things which are doubtful. So this hadith goes in line with that hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has set a criteria by which Muslims, you and I, as believers, we can decide whether something is permissible or not. Yes, we know as the hadith number six mentioned, the six series mentioned, halal is clear and evident. There is no doubt. Haram is clear and evident. There is no doubt. We cannot change and alter those two. It is there. But today, sad reality is, we as Muslims, when we do not know of something, if it is halal and haram, and we say, okay, since there is nothing clear, we, instead for us, in fact, instead for us to take the precautionary side, we will, we will say, or we will turn and say that, Okay, there is nothing confirming that it is haram, so obviously it will be on the halal side. That is a statement that we see in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save guard us and protect us. But in fact of saving our iman and saving our identity and our faith, this hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is showing us the way that we should take and the most appropriate way of how a Muslim should live. So the word is which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saying is that Leave that which you have doubt about or leave that which you are in doubt for those things which you have no doubt about. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us hadith in another statement to tell us what we did at the beginning day before. It is an idea, it is a criteria for us how to select something, how to tell something is right or wrong when we do not know the clarity behind it. Behind if it is halal or behind when it is haram. What is in the, in the between stage? How do we go about to choose it? <clears throat> there is another version of this hadith with different wordings, which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
he elaborated and he explained further and he said that verily the truth is tranquility. Truth brings tranquility and falsehood is doubt. And that means a truth, something which is true, something which is correct and is on the right path, it will lead one to have tranquility and contentment in their heart. And falsehood will obviously always lead one towards doubt. And this hadith, again, which the narrator of Hassan bin Ali radiallahu anhu, Prophet Sallallahu grandson, in the words is that, leaves that which put you in doubt. And the elaboration of another hadith is that doubt is the things, whatever is false will lead one toward doubt. So that's the criteria that was set by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It allows us as Muslims, it allows us as people, as people with intellect, ulul al-bab, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Many time and time again, the Quran, Allahum tatakaroon, Allahum tatakaroon, that you can ponder because mankind was given intellect, mankind was given that understanding to be able to differentiate between what is right and what is wrong. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam given us this criteria that allows us to judge what is false or wrong, that it regards something which is doubtful. And that which is true, something which is halal, something which we are confident in doing. And by following this criteria, this is the way one go about performing and how the one perform their good deeds or their act of deeds. The hadith indicates and tells us the way how we should also perform our deed, whether it is good or bad, to be able to differentiate it, which is permissible and proper. If you are certain about it, if you are positive about it, it will help you be good. During our salah, many a times scholars will tell us from salah and nawaf salah, optional salah in the night, it leads towards a sincerity, a calmness in the heart of a believer. Because it is goodness towards it. It is something which has no doubt. It makes one's one self become filled with tranquility, become filled with calmness and peace. Whereas if it, if it is to be on the contrary, on the opposite of doing an act which is not too good or it is not correct, then that falsehood will always leave one into a state of doubt. It will always leave one in a state of uneasiness because why? We won't feel that calmness within ourselves. We won't feel that peace and that contentment of our heart. So if a believer finds that our heart it is disturbed by something, or we are, which means we are uncertain by something, or we are doubtful of something, then as the status of a believer, we should stay away from those things. We should stay away from that thing which doesn't make our heart or doesn't make us feel content. The heart of a believer is always a heart that will remain at peace and tranquility at the sign of when something is true and when something is on hot and on the correct way. And the heart of a believer will become shaky, it will become unease, it will become, as we say, with tension at the sight of when something is wrong or when something is in falsehood or when something is not part of the correct way. So with this, as right as us to become righteous Muslim, this criteria is something that will apply to those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that opportunity to he guided themselves and they become righteous Muslim. Someone who is full understanding or someone who is conscious of the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and adhere to the guidance of Allah and His Rasul. If a Muslim were to indulge in forbidden acts, this criteria of differentiating, of, of, or of abstaining from something which is doubtful will not work for him. Because on a normal basis, on his day-to-day -day life and activities, he is indulging forbidden acts, he is indulging wrong action, then obviously the body becomes normal and become, becomes aligned and becomes accustomed to the type of wrong deed that's going on. So his heart will not feel that sort of sensitiveness and will not feel that sensitivity in regard when something is wrong to when something is right. So this criteria of being able to feel the uneasiness is when we truly adhere towards Allah and His Rasul. We truly accept to follow Allah and His Rasul and we follow the Quran and Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So 
<coughs> as believers, for us to be able to bring our heart and our conscience to that level that whenever we do something wrong, our heart become at ease. We need to be constant in fulfilling the obligations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be constant in gaining knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to also be able to strengthen our iman and our belief and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah of His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes we may find or we see the people who try to avoid doubtful matters, but while they're trying to avoid doubtful matters, they're involved in muharramat and the prohibited things and things which is clearly prohibited. For example, one is trying to avoid eating doubtful things, something which is not certain that he should eat, he avoid eating it. But on the other hand, he is foregoing his salawat days after days. He is neglecting his para and his compassion of salah. He is neglecting the right towards his parents. Then he is involving himself in muharramat, but at the same time trying to abstain from doubtful things. He will not feel and he will not have that feeling also embedded in his heart, that feeling of uncertainness when he, con when he interacts or when he conducts something which is doubtful. Because why? He's already, his body is already and his heart is already accustomed and involved in Muharramat acts. For example, in the history, there were these people who killed one of the grandson of Rasulullah They killed Hussein and he was a brother of the narrator of this hadith. And although same, same set of people, even though they killed their beloved grandson of Rasulullah after that they were sitting and having a discussion and having a mashura regarding to what, if it is, what is correct in regards to killing of mosquitoes. Now, killing of a mosquito is something which is insignificant in the eyes of mankind. But now, you did something which was more significant than that taking of life of a, of a Muslim, but you did not have any consideration that of carrying out such an action. But now at the time, it's something which much much more insignificant. You want to involve having discussion about it in a correct manner. And this to show it will not have any effect because the effect what was supposed to be in the heart from the beginning of avoiding anything which is wrong, it was already taken away. And there are many matters of issue regarding this to Sharia where scholars have different views and different opinions. Yes. <clears throat> For example, like some scholars say it's wajib, it's compulsory to resist Rafatia in Salah, while other scholars say it is not. Or paying zakat of Muslim, um, paying zakat for a woman's jewelry. So whether a woman has to pay zakat for a jewelry or not. So there's always different opinions among the scholars in those regards. And with regards to all of the scholars and the different opinions, whenever there is a different opinion, and there will be different ways, but obviously all of them are pathways from that of the Quran and Sunnah, then due to this hadith, some scholars have given opinion in regards to this hadith in these matters. So, for example, in the issue of a woman giving her jewelry, giving zakat on behalf of her jewelry, scholars say based on this hadith, one should take a cautious approach, which would be it is better to pay zakat on the jewelry because it's a most cautious, cautious approach. Because the other scholar did not take it into consideration and say it because the reason of not of having the different views is because of the soundness uh, of the hadith or the, or the narrators or <clears throat> the chains of narration in the hadith where there is some defect, the scholars look at the soundness of the hadith or the different proofs that they have. So that is why they do of their opinion and they follow in their opinion. But point here again, with this hadith of Rasulullah wasallam, even scholars of faith in the Islamic jurisprudence have taken it into consideration, not only with things which we deem as normal every day to day life, but even scholars of jurisprudence that things has to do, even if it's once in our lifetime or even if it's once a year, Scholars have looked into this hadith still to make practice upon it to show us how Muslims should be cautious with everything if you have no certainty about it. So looking back into the history of Islam, we also see and we also find that scholars, so some scholars were for one approach while other scholars were for the other. Thus, we will have some scholars who will take their evidence from what they have, and if other scholars does not have evidence, 
they will utilize these studies and go on to the cautious approach to, to be on a safe side for the consideration of it can be wrong or it can be right. Obviously, as principle of jurisprudence, if there's a situation in which there is conflict in views, where something is known for certain and some and something which is just a mere conjecture or something just, just a mere thought, obviously that which is known for sure will take precedence and will give preference over that which is not certain. So in that regard, obviously, the situation of taking what that cautious way is not definitely going to be applicable, but because of years, views on both sides, but one is more certain than the other. So obviously, certain will always be given preference. But in regards to matters when there is no certain view of one side, but there is there is probably good, both and bad, but there is no certainty in both sides, then we always take the cautious side. An example of this, for example, is that if we know for sure there was impurity to cotton our clothes, but we want to use that clothes and the piece of garment to perform our salah. But we do not know which part of our clothes that impurity is, but we are certain there is impurity. So here, we are certain there is impurity on our clothes, but we are not certain or we are not sure which part of our clothes has that impurity. So what should we do? Now in that instance, obviously, scholars agree that we wash the whole clothes to avoid and to remove that impurity. So one, you wash the whole clothes, which will be the form of cautious, because you are certain that there was impurity, but you wasn't certain where the impurity is. So instead of just washing, washing piece, which you're not certain about, you wash the whole clothes to remove the certainty that you had at the beginning. So that is how cautious, in regards to this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of leave that which you have doubt to that which you do not have any doubt. To show us that any sort of doubtful things will should be removed so that we can have certainty in an action and certainty in doing one of the good things. And we need to understand <clears throat> if something is clearly permissible in Sharia, clearly permissible in Islam, there is no point in refraining from doing it with the intention of doing so for ibadah. Because if it is permissible, we shouldn't say, oh, I'll avoid it because um, you know, I'm doubtful if if so and so or if such a thing is um is good. But I'm certain that it is not a prohibited in Sharia. An example, for example, I would say meat. Today we have many people that's avoiding the use and consumption of meat and they go towards vegetarian. Again, I'm not saying anything is wrong, but now for example, meat is halal to consume obviously once it's only Islamic Zabiha. But to make it prohibited on yourself is something which does not have anything to do with Islam. Because it is something which is permissible in Sharia. So there is no point in refraining in from it and say, okay, I'll become a vegetarian and it will be a form of ibadah. No, it will not be a form of ibadah. But it will just be your own personal preference. So it has nothing to do with Sharia, it has nothing to do with Islamic law. But obviously, if it is for a good reason, for example, maybe health reason, Certain people, when they have high blood pressure, they cannot consume red meat. And to avoid that and such things for health reasons, which is for good reasons, then it is okay. But again, it will not be as a form of ibadat and form of worship. One of the tricks of shaitan, which we as Muslims, we need to understand shaitan plays tricks in numerous ways and in various ways. And one of the tricks that shaitan does is that he will make something which is forbidden and he will present it in such a way which to our eyes it will look permissible. And as Muslims, we need to be very careful to avoid getting deceived by the merits and the beauty that shaitan creates around us. If something is haram, if something is in the muharramat level, no matter how you twist and turn it, it is going to be forbidden still. And in the Sharia, in the fiqh, in the jurisprudence, scholars refer to this but hey, without a doubt, and you cannot change it once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah so wants to make it prohibited, it is prohibited without a doubt. We cannot be influenced by the deception of shaitan to change our perception and thinking that something which is for, forbidden can be made permissible even if we, we just change the name around or we change some other scheme to get with it. Then it can never be made permissible once it has already been forbidden. And similarly, it's in the opposite scenario. If something was already Permissible and being permitted, 
no matter how it is being done, it will not be able to become prohibited and become unlawful and haram because it was already being permissible. So, in conclusion, this hadith as Muslims, it equips us with a practical criterion by which we can judge action, we can judge which is correct action or which is the wrong action, and which something is, no cl is not clear to us, which something was not stipulated exactly from Sharia. It will help us to avoid action which is doubtful, in especially in many situations which we encounter in our everyday life. And it helps us as Muslims to make and do the right decision and make the correct decision in these matters. However, we also as Muslims need to understand how to apply such criterion correctly and not to be deceived by the wrong perceptions and the wrong interests. And that is why we, in these matters, we also need to educate ourselves to be able to implement the correct way and to be able to keep our mind set on the correct perception we also need to educate ourselves with Islamic knowledge. And that is why, alhamdulillah, we're trying to have these sessions, we're trying to have these series, and many other things from Masjid as so that we can reach out to you, we can enlighten you, and we, we can educate ourselves and others on how we can gain more knowledge of Islam, and how we can also make ourselves a better Muslim in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to achieve his jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us all May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our effort. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings. And whatever I have said that may be of benefit, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to put it in practice. And whatever I have said that may have been of any wrong or may have been of any error, it is from myself and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that we can understand and put it in the practice. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.